Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Stegner Award of 2010. Uh, I have a quick and important announcement that is Mr. Turner has to leave promptly at 10 o'clock, so the chances for individual conversations are extremely slim. In fact, they aren't there. <laughs> so I thank you ahead of time for your cooperation and getting him out the door and on his way to his next gathering. And, of course, I want to give my usual thanks to the center board, to the center faculty, and the center staff, and especially today to Al and Carol Ann Olson, who make this occasion possible. The individuals who are famous to people of my age group are rarely the individuals who are famous to people who are 30 or 40 years younger. Household names to one age group are strangers and phantoms to people of the other age group. So, preparing for a visit from Ted Turner provides a rare exception to this pattern. If a person in her 50s says to a person in his early 20s, Ted Turner will be here to get the Center Steiner Award, we get to skip the part where the young person says, who is that? <laughs> and the part where I try not to say, how could you not know who that is? Instead, the young person just says, that's amazing, when will he be here? So, that has been a pleasant month or so as we are all joined together in cross-generational like-mindedness, looking forward to seeing and hearing a visitor with such an extraordinary record of innovation and originality. He has such a habit of leap leaping over the usual fences and corrals of established thinking that when you start to refer to him as an out-of-the-box thinker, your next thought is that the phrase out-of-the-box thinker is itself a cliché and a platitude and a kind of in-the-box kind of phrase convicting you of a lack of originality and innovation. <laughs> in other words, if you try to compete with him on the turf of originality and innovation, you are down for the count pretty fast. Ted Turner jumped ahead of his contemporaries and saw the potential of satellite communications, and the result is a nearly unequaled record of entrepreneurial success. Entrepreneurial success soon provided the foundation for philanthropy on an equally innovative and original scale. Your programs that you have have a summary of Mr. Turner's career, and I'm not going to repeat that. And of course, it is goofy to sit listening to me when you could be listening to him. Moreover, everyone in the room today came into the room already knowing the key phrases. Cable News Network or CNN, Turner Broadcasting System, Turner Network Television, Atlanta Braves, Ted's Montana Grill, Turner Foundation, Goodwill Games, Nuclear Threat Initiative, UN Foundation. So, I will let you read over the summary and the program, and instead I will remind you that today we're focusing on the matters of his commitment to the American West, on the value of nature, landscapes, and endangered species, and on the big picture of Ted Turner's work to offer a legacy of value to our posterity. We are focusing on these topics because the occasion this morning is to give Ted Turner the Senate of the American West Stegner Award, which we will do promptly at 9.54 this morning. <laughs> and so, just vote here. And so I will end this introduction in the unique manner of the Senate of the American West with three limericks that I have composed, which are remarkable, I would even say extraordinary, in their brevity, clarity, and aim. The media mogul named Ted cannot be controlled or led. It seems to be working so far. <laughs> yeah, sorry again. Oh, art. Oh, literary art is so strenuous, really. Um, okay, here we go again. The media mogul named Ted cannot be controlled or led. That magician of cable defies every label and turns every thought on its head. <laughs> okay. And now we move on to uh, the theme of Ted's restoration of landscapes in the West and the key role of species restoration. Okay. When Ted considered the West, he saw that the land needed rest. He set out to restore what had been there before with chutzpah, moxie, and zest. <laughs> <laughs> and now we get to Ted's Montana Grill and 
the interesting process of thought by which Mr. Turner thought that if he was going to save the bison and develop an enthusiasm for the restoration of bison, there had to be a market, a commercial uh, connection for that for that cause. So, and Ted's Montana Grill, is important to say, is opening on Pearl, on Pearl Street on, I think, to the public on Monday, well, early next week. Okay. This is stirring and moving, really, here. Okay. The bison were starting to fade, but now they're often sautéed. <laughs> <laughs> to be economically viable, they would have to be liable for the lunching and dining out trade. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the 2010 Center of the American West Stegner Award, Ted Turner. Okay, okay. Uh, I am going to ask some questions. And Mr. Turner, may I answer those Call questions? Call me Ted. <laughs> That's not the easiest thing on the planet, really, to pull off here. But, Ted, I'm going to ask Ted some questions, and we'll see if those turn out to be the questions he wants to answer. But he will answer a question that will be very interesting, and you'll profit from the answer. So I would like um, to quote from his wonderful book, Call Me Ted. Quote, I quickly fell in love with the beauty of the big sky country. Could you tell us that story with more detail, more Background. Well, I grew up in the southeast in Georgia and South Carolina along the coast, and the ecosystem there uh, is totally different than out, than out west. We, we get an average of about 50 inches of rainfall there, lots of mosquitoes and ticks and red bugs or chiggers, and uh, I didn't like that. It's hot and humid in the, in the summertime, real hot and real humid. And when I first came out west in my late 40s, I came to a convention. Well, I, I, there were a lot of meetings in Denver, and the cable industry was headquartered there. So I came out to Denver quite often, but I just stayed in the hotel and called on the cable operators, and then, then I flew back to Atlanta. I was working all the time. So I really hadn't had a chance to really see the, see the west or the Great Plains uh, and, and the Rocky Mountain Front because I collected property in both along the Rocky Mountain front and out, out in the Great Plains into uh, Kansas and Oklahoma and South Dakota. And, but, 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 but first I, I got uh, a friend of mine bought a ranch in Wyoming and he invited me out to spend a, a couple of days with him and I did that and I went fly fishing. Uh, I fished a little bit but mainly with uh, spinning tackle and bait casting tackle in the southeast for largemouth bass. And I like to fish. And I, I, but I went for the first time fly fishing in a mountain stream in, in the, on the edge of the Rockies. There was a, happened to be the Little Bighorn River, which flows through Wyoming. Well, I, I just, uh, I don't think I caught any fish, but I just fell, fell in love with it. And I decided I wanted to buy a, a little ranch and uh, just to see and, and, and spend some time and see how, how, how attached I came to it. And I bought a little ranch. It was about a, a little over a 1,000 acres. had a mile of trout stream on it. And it uh, wasn't a particularly good trout stream, but it was, had a few trout in it. And, uh, but, but I, and I spent uh, several weeks that next summer out, out in the, uh, on the edge of the Rockies. And I just fell in love with it. And I said... I, and then, then I, that's where the bison had been, and I'd studied them all my life. I was, uh, when I was a little boy, I was fascinated by the natural world. I read all the books uh, starting when I was seven, eight years old, as soon as I could read. And uh, I was butterflies, and I, I spent a lot of time outdoors uh, studying the animals, the birds, uh, the insects, uh, reptiles, you name it. I had a, a little zoo with frogs and turtles and anything I could lay my hands on, I was taking care of them. And, um, so I, the, the whole thing. And then, but, but, but the bison intrigued me the most because it was the largest land animal in North America. And it was one that came within, you know, from 30 million down to 200. 
uh, but so close to extinction, and thank God they were, were saved. That, and I wanted to be part of that. And I started with three bison close to 30 years ago, and now I have 55,000. That's exponential growth. Talk about, I, I really know about population explosion. When all your cows have, have a, a baby pretty much every year, 85% calf crop, you're wrong. You, you, you can increase and, and 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 while I had the money, I, I was buying the I, I bought those ranches, the two million acres and f- fifteen ranches. Uh, as the bison herd was expanding, I had to have a place for them to go and, and eat and live. So I, I I bought these cattle ranches and converted them over to uh, to bison, and uh, because I like bison and I don't like cattle particularly, and I they, they, they just it's it's hard to love them both. You know, it's like. It, it's it, it's anyway <laughs> anyway I, I I finally stopped because I, it was either we were going to run out of land uh, or I was going to run out of money and I ran out of money before we ran out of land for me to buy so while well, there's still ranches for sale out west in fact quite a few right now because real estate market is uh, is hurting a little bit like the rest of the economy but at any rate I'm really Glad that uh, that I did it. I, I passed the federal government. And they, the federal government has about 25,000 bison. They're the second largest bison owner. And that includes Yellowstone Park and the rest of the national parks. They've got a lot more acreage than I do, but they don't manage uh, as intensely as I do. Anyway, along the way, uh, with bringing back the bison, I ran across prairie dogs. And uh, and I studied them, and, 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 and we killed them from three billion out on the Great Plains when the white man first appeared down to uh, a couple of million. And uh, maybe that's a little high, but, but and I'm talking about black tail prairie dogs. So I decided all I had on my all the ranches that I had bought was a few little remnant populations of a few hundred. And uh, we've intensely ma- managed uh, and encouraged prairie dogs too. And now we have about 250,000 of them on the on the ranches, and and that that's 10 percent of all the prairie dogs in the world, and and uh, we've got 11 percent of all the bison. So and then and, and we're bringing back black-footed ferrets, uh, which have to have large prairie dog colonies in order to live. The the uh, black-footed ferret came within; they thought it was extinct. They found a few and they brought them in and, and raised them in captivity, and now there's several thousand of them mostly in captivity, but we're, we're putting them back out. And we have large enough prairie dog colonies to uh, support uh, a couple of, uh, of, 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 of uh, herds of, of uh, black-footed ferrets. And, and, and the burrowing owls have reappeared. Burrowing owls can't burrow. Uh, they have to use prairie dog uh, uh, burrows. And when there are no prairie dogs, there's no burrowing owls. And uh, this probably doesn't hurt anybody's feelings, but uh, the, 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 the rattlesnakes uh, need prairie dog burrows too, and, and a prairie dog town will usually have lots of rattlesnakes too. They mainly eat grasshoppers, and if you, as long as you're, you're careful, and, and these prairie, prairie rattlers uh, aren't very poisonous. My son-in-law got bit by one, and he didn't even go to the doctor. I mean, they, their poison is very mild, uh, not like the eastern diamondback uh, that we have down in South Georgia and Florida, that, back where I come from, they'll kill you. I mean, but 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 I passed uh, I passed rules on my property. We use on uh, two million acres, no pesticides whatsoever. We do use some herbicides. We have to use herbicides because the exotic weeds are so bad that in many instances they will completely take over take over your habitat. And, uh, and turn it into a virtual desert as far as bison and the American animals are concerned. So we, we, we and, and, and I we don't kill we don't kill anything. Uh, we we do hunting legally uh, in the seasons and we go strictly with uh, the rules. But but we only uh, we only kill surplus uh, animals and uh, uh, for for sport and. Uh, but we don't kill rattlesnakes unless I t- tell my employees that 
you know, if, if you're being threatened and you're cornered by, by, by a, a poisonous snake, you can kill it under those circumstances. But if it's just out there roaming around, leave them alone. And uh, that's just some of the things that, uh, that we've done. But, but the pesticides, the reason the songbirds are deteriorating and disappearing at such a rapid rate as they are uh, is because of all the pesticides. We're killing the insects, and uh, they, that's what the birds eat. And if they don't have any insects, they starve to death. And uh, we should stop using it. And, and, and we do it on our lawns. I mean, we put this Pennington green on our lawns, and our dogs go out there and eat that grass with all that poison on it, and our grandchildren play in that grass and get cancer. That's the reason we've got an epidemic of cancer in this country is all the chemicals that we pour on the country. Why do we do that? I mean, in Iowa, for instance, which is the richest farmland in the world, where we grow most of our corn, they use so many pesticides on, on, on that corn that the state of Iowa has almost no wildlife of any type whatsoever. It's an absolute biological desert. Uh, the uh, poison has leached down 500 feet, and most of the farms in Iowa... The farmers have to import bottled water. They can't drink the water out of the wells because it's been poisoned for 100 years with these goddamn pesticides. I mean, let's have a few grasshoppers. What's, what's wrong with that? And it, it's great for the, for the wildlife, I mean, because, you know, the birds eat those grasshoppers too. Anyway, it's just one thing that just goes on and on and on. We, we have been irresponsible stewards of the land. We, and, and, and let me tell you, those, those bison were killed from 30 million down to 200 without a single biological study done by a doctor or, or scientist because we didn't have many. But, but, but we exterminated the bison without even studying it. And we did the same thing with the prairie dogs. What in the hell were we thinking? You know, looking back, you know, that's why I enjoy being around education because there is a chance for us with, with better education, we can do a better job of managing uh, our biosphere. We certainly can't do a much worse one. And, uh, but, but what I try and do is, 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 is be at the forefront and, 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 and do things in a way that other people, young people learning about it, they're like you, the students saw uh, We'll, we'll change the way that we're doing things because we can change. There's no, we really have learned a lot. Consider it was only 200 years ago that we had the Industrial Revolution. Before that, for the millions of years of human history, three million years, we, uh, we, lived, in, um, we lived in balance with nature pretty much. Now we've just gone crazy. When I was born in 1938, there were two, two billion people in the world. Now there's seven. Three and a half times as many people in just 70 years. And uh, a billion people go to bed hungry every night. That's intolerable. I'm, I'm on the UN committee now to help end poverty. I'm taking that on too, you know, what the hell. <laughs> it's, just, you know, it's just another little challenge. I think maybe I should yeah, get another question. I'm well, sorry. It's a curious situation. I'm um, sorry, but, but but basically, that's the, the answer. Now we need the question. Right. Um, it's, it is a remarkable experience because usually, as an interviewer, the per person will say something boring, and that's your moment to say, oh, well, shifting topics. But since he doesn't say anything boring, there's really no moment for me. But I do have some very fine questions that, uh, that Philip and I have enjoyed very much in a, over time. Um, okay, so I, I'm going to ask another question because it's kind of key. Oh, no, I, I can't pass this up. Okay, you love old movies. I love old movies? Yeah. I haven't seen an old movie in years. <laughs> no, I don't this is not part of it on the future. Okay. I'm not living in the past anymore. I, okay. I, I'm 71, and I don't, have a, I don't know when my time is going to run out. And okay. I want to get as much That's, done as I can oh, please, to save yes. this planet. You seem I, to be I, very I, vital. I, but you but seem very the old vital, movies, so. I learned a lot watching the old movies. Right, and that's my question. A lot of old values are in old yes, movies. Yes, yes. And so. I like old values. <laughs> okay. I like old okay. people. Yes, me too. <laughs> I, since I've become one. Okay. okay, so um, 
doing that to I love people too. Right, me too. I couldn't agree more. So I like everything. <laughs> One time, I, one of my wives, I said, honey, I sure love you. He said, that doesn't mean squat. You love everything. All right. Okay, I want to ask very quickly here. You love old movies, and in some ways, uh, some of your enterprises really rested on getting old movies out where other people who loved them could see them. Gone with the Wind, is that a good movie? Is it a good movie? Uh-huh. There's a bear poop in the woods? There you are. Okay. But you never, you never refer to Westerns, even though so much of well, your life... Well, I watched them. But I, but I, the, the, the westerns have too many damn cows in them. <laughs> when I see I, I a western movie, I want to see bison in it. I want the real thing. Oh, clear to me now. I can't. I was. Very I made a whole now. bunch of western movies. Mm-hmm. Right. You uh, know, for television, the, 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 it with. I made a, a series of six movies with the uh, American Indians that we got Indian uh, writers to do the writing, Indian actors. The whole thing was done by. Done by Indians, they were great. Geronimo and Crazy Horse and Broken Chain and Lakota Woman, those were four of them. Okay, and now I have one more uh, very Western-related question. Here's a quotation from Call Me Ted. I remember how excited I was when I went out there to the West as a landowner. I went into the local store and bought a couple of pairs of stiff jeans, Western boots, and a cowboy hat. Walking out of the store, I looked like a city slicker. I think I still had the price tag on my hat. I did. <laughs> and I'm sure the locals on the street got a good laugh. Could you tell us about the process of becoming at ease with cowboy boots and cowboy hats and feeling uh, that you were no longer a source of it was, hilarity? It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't hard. I, I just I knew I was going to get laughed at when I walked out of that store with all those uh with the price tags hanging off the clothes, you know, and then brand new, you know, you looking, I look like, you know, a dude from back east, and that's what I, what's what I was. And then what happened? Did they just, they, you washed them several I, I, times? I washed or? the jeans a whole <laughs> bunch of times. <laughs> that's I still got some of them. The secret of westernization. Wash the jeans, we know. Now, uh, now, getting back to land restoration, I want to uh, read a quotation from your manager, Russ Miller, who manages all of the ranches. Right. Is that right? Uh, great quotation. It was apparent to me that Ted was a romantic artist, and he saw the landscape as a great environmental canvas. And Ted was also an astute businessman, and he saw the landscape as a compelling spreadsheet. So... Help us understand how the artist and the businessman, the canvas and the spreadsheet, how they coexist and, and collaborate. Well, I didn't know anything about the West when I got out here. And I went to a couple of museums and I saw a couple of paintings by Albert Bierstadt, who painted the Rocky Mountains uh, probably better than anybody. And I, I ran, I became acquainted with Thomas Moran, who did mainly the Grand Canyon and uh, Yellowstone Falls. He, he, he was, anyway, there were no cows in those pictures. I didn't particularly like Remington and Russell because there was all cows and cowboys. So I didn't ever buy any of that work. But I bought the beer stats. And I, 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 at the time I got interested in them, the money was rolling in. So I rolled it back out buying all this artwork. and, and I made copies of these paintings, the ones that are in my homes, and they're all hanging in Ted's Montana Grill. Uh, I, got, I ended up with about 20 beer stats and six or seven Morans, and, and and you can make photographic copies of them now and blow them up. To, to they, they don't look near as good as the original, but they look pretty good, and this was a way to share my art collection with people that are in the restaurant having a bison burger. And uh, so when you go in, if, if the New restaurant that's uh, opening next next week in uh, downtown Boulder. Uh, you'll the, the the paintings mean something because they're copies of the ones that hang in my home. So, um, but the, how the businessmen and the artists work together, and how you manage the land so that that it is beautiful, but also economically well, profitable. Do, or the, 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 the operating a, the business. Uh, or just operating your life, you do it the same way. And, and that's why I wrote the book, so I wouldn't have to answer these questions over and over again. Well, that didn't work, did it? <laughs> Doesn't seem to have worked out. Uh, okay, well, here are questions that do not 
that are not answered in the book, I think. That's why I wrote the other book, too. I haven't gotten that Answer the questions that came up after the first one. No matter what you do, you're going to make mistakes. You know, and the the main thing is, is you want to correct them. Correct the mistakes. Right. And get as close to perfect as you can. And, uh... And, 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 and work real hard to try and make this world a better, more intelligent, kinder, more equitable place for people and for all that little other critters that we share the, the planet, uh, planet with. I made up some bumper stickers. Well, I've, I've had made up two bumper stickers. One is the title of the next book, and it's Save the Humans. The whole idea, people say, oh, Save the Humans? Well, there's lots of humans. We don't need saving. Oh, yes, we do. We've got nuclear weapons, 10,000 of them pointed at each other on hair trigger alert. The push of a button and 30 minutes later, everybody in the United States is dead. But that, listen, that we, we've still got those weapons. They're sitting there from the Cold War because we don't know what to do with them. I'm telling you, I'm disappointed in our Congress. I mean, I, I work with them all the time, but... Uh, you know, they, 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 they can't agree about anything. We couldn't get a, a bill through, an energy bill. Uh, we, we've done nothing about global warming with the, with the Congress. I mean, it, it's just, you know, we're going to sit here and burn ourselves up is what we're going to do. And it's going to happen in the next 20 years. Our, our children are going to be suffering like crazy from our inattention to what we need to be doing. And we better, you know, if I was a young person, I'd be screaming bloody murder. I'd be out there. I'd start my own Tea Party movement, you know, or maybe something else. <laughs> I mean, a different name. I, I, I don't like that name. I've just given that as an example of people that are fed up. Uh, Actually, my next question was really... Am going, I fed up? I, I bet you are. I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. <laughs> and you haven't. <laughs> so why That's did you start old, now? <laughs> That's from an old movie called Network. I, I know that. Oh. Okay, so I'm going to ask you that, but it was about 30 years ago. The, having brought up the matter that we're not doing so well in political terms, and we seem to be at a polarized stalemate in the West, that's and especially it. yes, that polarized stalemate. That's yeah. good. That could be a limerick too. I like that. Mate, you could rhyme. Stop mate. polarized stalemate. That's, I, that's Let's all thing. work together for a better America and a better world. What's wrong with that? Well, you know, I don't. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a human being first and a Democrat or Republican second. You know, let's do what's best for, the, uh-huh. best for our children and grandchildren. How about being good stewards of our world? You know, how about not ruining it? We don't have to. We don't have to ruin it. We can take good care of it. And that's what my life has been all dedicated to, is to taking, showing people how we can take care of it. Okay. If I could read this question. Okay, you can. <laughs> Oh, I'm quoting you. When meeting someone with a completely different background and contrasting point of view, I found it helpful to start out by discussing things you have in common. Going back to my high school debate days, and we've had several students tell us how much his sponsoring of the debate program for kids has meant to them, uh, I've enjoyed discussing topics with people who don't necessarily share my opinions. The Senate of the American West, is that's our program. That's our statement of our program. How can we... Take that example and be more effective in taking what often turns out to be shouting well, matches. Start out, start out by in our relations with other uh, our friends and neighbors by treating them with respect, dignity, and friendliness, and keeping an open mind. And because that's what I did when I went to Russia the first time, I I decided I'd already been to Cuba and met Castro. I decided I was not going to sit by and let the Cold War keep going. It had already been going for 40 years, and uh, we hated each other, and we were calling them the evil empire. And that's the best way to get in a fight in the world is to say, walk into a bar in Colorado and say, I hate Colorado. This place sucks. The people are a bunch of jerks. The food's lousy, goddamn ugly. I mean, you're going to get whacked right in the kisseroo, right? I mean, you'll get crushed. And that's exactly what we were doing with the Russians. No wonder we were telling them they were a bunch of godless commies and everything. I mean, so I I went over there and I didn't say anything bad. I just said, gee, what a beautiful country. What nice people, you know. 
They said, we are nice people? Nobody's ever called us nice people before. I said, well, I'm doing it. I said, I'm over here to, and I had a KGB agent go with me. After I started, we got, got the first Goodwill Games organized. And they thought I was crazy, and, and he wanted to, he said, Ted, you know, I, I work in one of the government agencies. I said, I know that. And he said, I've been asked to ask you some questions. And I said, what is it? He said, what? Why are you being so nice to us? We, we, we're not used to this. I mean, what, what, do, you, what do you want? Why, why don't you just dump on us like everybody else does? You know, they, they felt inferiority complex because everybody was calling them godless commies all the time. And there are a lot of people in the United States that are godless and some that are even commies or were. <laughs> uh, I said, well, let me tell you, Yuri. He, I, I knew he was a KGB agent. I said, I said, I love my country and I love my children. I didn't have any grandchildren then. I said, I love my children and I love my country. And I've studied this situation. And if my children and my country are going to survive, we're going to have to learn to get, get along together because we have these nuclear weapons and we can blow each other to kingdom come in an hour. And I don't want that to happen. I want my children to grow up and be happy. And that means I've got to love your children and your country too. And the idea of bombing Moscow and St. Petersburg, I've been there. There's over 100 museums in St. Petersburg, more than any other city in the world. And they, have, they house the art uh, of the Renaissance and going all the way back because the czars had a lot of money. And, and, and they bought all this artwork and brought it back to uh, what was then Russia and the Soviet Union. I said, I don't want to destroy the artwork. And I don't want to destroy the Kremlin. And I don't want you destroying the Capitol building, the Washington Monument, and the Lincoln Memorial. I said, I, I, I love all this stuff. But I'm going to have to love you and love your children and in order for us to survive. Then maybe we can get rid of the, rid of the nuclear weapons and, and learn to live together like friends and neighbors, which we are on this little planet. I see everybody as a neighbor. I'm going to Africa next month. I'm going to spend two weeks totting around. I just got back from India. I went to Tiger Park. I, I, I'm going out and enjoying seeing the parts of the world now that I'm old, as well as doing my work on poverty and so forth. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going out to enjoy the beauty of, of the different cultures and the different music and the different, different uh, religions and the different cultures. I mean, the world is just fascinating, fascinating. And let's just take care of it you know, and, and make sure it's there for our children and grandchildren. You know, and, and, and let's correct the things that we're doing wrong. We know what they are. We've got... Global communications, 50 years ago, 70 years ago, half the people in the world were illiterate. Now 80% are illiterate. we still got 20% illiteracy. We, there's no excuse for that. But we could, we could do away with that in 10 years if we have a, 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 a teaching program to teach the people that still can't read and write. They're mostly older, older folks. But, but we, we increased our education, our liter the literacy rate, from 50% to 80% in our lifetime. That's worth, and, and in 1900, in 1900, none of the women in the world had equal rights with men. And today, half the women in the world do. It's a disgrace that only half the women in the world have equal rights with men. But still, when you go back 70 years, and none did, that's pretty big progress. Now let's dedicate ourselves in the next 20 years to bringing... But bringing women's equality to every woman in the world, where women have equal opportunities for jobs, equal opportunities for education, because there's nothing we can do that will cut the population growth back faster than that. If we have women are educated and they have other opportunities, they won't stand for having seven or eight kids just pregnant all the goddamn time. It's a pain in the neck. So, too many things. We've got to stop doing the dumb things and start doing the smart things. And we know what it is. We've got global communications, too. I mean, there's, it, but when, when Princess Diana was killed in that automobile accident, 99% of the people in the world knew about it in 24 hours. Hmm. Now, that's pretty good. Hmm. And when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, it took two weeks for people to find out. 
that uh, there's two more ternarian ways that I'd like to talk about the uh, willingness to talk to your enemies. And I think I, I would reproach myself if I didn't have you speak about the total weirdness of your having a congenial lunch with Rupert Murdoch with the notion that if Ted Turner and Rupert Murdoch can go to an amiable lunch, then anything is possible in the world. So could you... I invited him to Test Montana Grill. <laughs> That's great. It's so, so good that it's impossible to be a meanie when you're at it. <laughs> Your attitude has to be one of generosity and friendship. So You feel so good. Why did you invite him? Because I was sick of it. Sick of fighting. And, 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 and it wasn't doing any good anyway. And uh, I'd already cussed him all I could. And he cussed me a lot, too. It seemed a fair... Well, I'm sure so we fair made that at you. Huh. But I, 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 I was already friends with Fidel Castro when I met him back in 1982. And if I could be friends with a godless commie leader, you know, I don't know why I couldn't you know, tolerate Rupert Murdoch. And I think he's doing a good job with the Wall Street Journal, I have yeah, to say. Yeah. Uh, a couple more uh, Trinarian spirit things. I did, you know, his news network is a little too right for me, but, but on the other hand, he's got the right to do it. The right wing should have a voice. I, I agree with that, even if I don't agree with what they say. Uh, the uh, peaceful coexistence of realism and optimism in your life. You've been... Covering that, with, with a little, with a little bit of, uh, a little bit of leaning towards optimism. Yeah, but you have, if I can quote a few more, we're a step away from catastrophe, but we're also a step away from paradise. That's the last, last paragraph in Tell Me Ted. Right. Pretty good, huh? I like the book. <laughs> I like the book quite a bit. And I, I said, we're, yes, we're the people that invented nuclear, nuclear weapons and poison gas and bio-warfare, but we also did the, are responsible for the Mona Lisa and Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. <laughs> Not bad, huh? It wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. It's very good. beautiful. We were very responsible for a lot of beauty and a lot of love and a lot of goodness. And most people are good. For instance, I'll bet you there's not one person in this room that would like to see us bomb people. Then why don't we stop bombing them? We're the big bombers. You know, whenever I meet a Vietnamese who is one of our biggest friends now, and they just beat us in a war just 30 years ago, whenever I meet a Vietnamese, I apologize for the 3 million Vietnamese that we bombed with Asian Orange and uh, Napalm with our B-52s during that war. We, we lost 50,000 troops, but we killed 3 million people in Vietnam with, with all that stuff and gave them cancer with uh, that Asian Orange. That was chemical warfare, you know, and chemical warfare has been banned by the Geneva Convention. What in the hell were we doing pouring all those chemicals all over, killing all their trees and plants? Remember, that's what it was designed to kill. Let me tell you something. You've got a pesticide that kills trees and plants. That's not going to be good for people that are walking around down there or for monkeys or elephants or anything else. You don't deliberately pour poison on other people unless you're a nut, you know. And why are we doing that? Why are we, what, what good are our aircrafters, aircraft carriers in Afghanistan? We spent trillions of dollars on them. The, Jap the Chinese want some aircraft carriers. The, we owe them $2 trillion. Why don't we give them our aircraft carriers instead and write off the debt, you know? Uh, and then they can have them. I don't know what they're going to do with them, you know? <laughs> I mean, because bombing people is going to be out of fashion very soon. In fact, it already is out of fashion. They, it, the Israelis had to stop bombing Gaza because it was on the news, the CNN, it, and it looked so horrible. Everybody was turning against the Jewish people for bombing these poor, uh, poor uh, uh, Palestinians that live in Gaza. You know, and they, they, and, and they, they had to had to stop doing it, and we had to stop doing it over in Afghanistan because these insurgents they know that if they come out and fight in the open against all our uh, airplanes and uh, z uh, drones and all this other sophisticated crap that we've got, that, that we're going to kill a lot of civilians if, 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 we, if they stay in the houses. 
and in the little villages, and that's what they do. So whenever we bomb an insurgent, we kill a whole bunch of civilians and children and grandmothers, and they show that on the news. Well, it looks terrible. You know, nowadays, PR and trade, you know, when you go out bombing people in the world, you're bombing your customers. You know, I mean, that doesn't make sense. I mean, and, and we, we don't, the people in Boulder aren't trying to bomb Denver. You know, I mean, I mean, that would be terrible. I like that. I, and it would be even worse if Denver were to bomb yeah, Boulder. Yeah, that would be very bad. Really bad. Really, really bad. Smaller really town and you'd be blowing up your university. <laughs> Oh. That's why I want to stop bombing. <laughs> it's uncivilized. Civilized people don't bomb each other. Uh, on this realism and optimism thing, your, your comrade in a Colorado, John Malone, I, I'll quote from him and then ask you where this trait came from that he describes. Ted's always had that kind of basic, almost childish logic about him that refuses to accept artificial impediments. I think one of his big secrets of success over the years and that is that things that most of us would sit there and ponder, all these regulatory and legal reasons why we couldn't do something that, you, that we wanted to do, Ted would just say, oh, hell, you can overcome those kinds of things, and he'd just do it. So where did that trait come from? And you? Well, it came, basically, it's, it's, it's the difference between winners and losers. Winners never quit. And losers never win, and quitters never win. So it's like base baseball. The first five years that I owned the Braves, we came in last in interdivisional play all five years. And when I bought the team, I said, we'll have a World Series in Atlanta in five years. And in the fifth year, Furman Bisher, who was a sports editor, came to see me, and he said, Turner, I was there five years ago when you bought the Braves. He said, you're in last place again this year, and you've been last for the last five years. What, what do you have to say? I said, we're going to do like the Russians. We're going to start a new five-year plan. We'll do five. It took 18 years to get the World Series in Atlanta, but by God, I got it there. And before I was done, we won 14 years in a row to set a record that, will, that stands forever at all professional sports. No one has ever won their division 14 years consecutively in hockey and basketball in football or in baseball. So I went from the biggest loser to the biggest winner. Now, uh, and the reason is I just wouldn't quit. And I years ago, I was underwriting Captain Cousteau's voyages, and I was on the Calypso with him and interviewing him. It was right after Reagan was elected president, and he just called the Soviet Union an evil empire, and I was a little discouraged. Uh, and I said to Captain Cousteau, I, 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 Captain, I get, he said, Ted, even if we knew for sure that we were going to lose. He said, but which we don't. We don't know for sure. What else could men of good conscience do but fight to the very end? And I put that away. And whenever I tend to get discouraged about the population problem or bombing or poison gas or Agent Orange or whatever this stuff, the screw up of the day is, I decide, I think about that. I said, not going to get discouraged. And, and another cute one is uh, a guy that was running the Turner Foundation at the beginning would come into the room and he would hold his hand up and say, the situation is hopeless, but I could be wrong. <laughs> you know, and, and I use the analogy, my analogy was, what, where are we and where are we headed? I said, it's, it's like a baseball game. It's the seventh inning, and we're down by two runs. The game's not over. All we got to do is hold them right where they are and score three runs in the last two innings. And that's what we're behind the eight ball. We are behind. We need to catch up and catch up fast. That's why I'm here. Nobody's paying me to come here. I mean, I could have gotten some money if I'd have, I could have be working in the restaurant selling a burger or two. <laughs> Anyway, but that's, that's basically the way I feel. I will not surrender. I've got a lot of flags in my flag bag. When you've got a sailboat, you've got, you carry signal flags with you, you know, like SOS and that sort of thing in case you need them. But I, all the flags in my bag, I didn't have a white flag. There was no, no surrender. That's what you put up when you surrender. And guess, so speaking of surrendering, 
You know, because now we talk about wars. We win the war. Did we win the war in Iraq? Hell no. But let me tell you, you know who the last person that surrendered was? The last country that surrendered? Japan in 1945 hmm. on the battleship Missouri. Since then, the, the Korean War never ended. It's still going on. It, 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 that Vietnam War never ended. You know, we just pulled out. I mean, we, we, nobody surrendered. We haven't won a war in 70 years since World War II, to tell you the truth. Winning means the other t- guys surrender, right? Let's get it straight. We're not going to win in Afghanistan because they ain't going to surrender, I'll guarantee you. They'll never surrender. And if we, during the Vietnam War, if the President of the United States says, I can't take it anymore, we're not going to screw around, we've already killed 3 million people and they won't surrender, we're going to I call up Ho Chi Minh and say, listen, if you don't surrender by Friday at noon, we're going to take every nuclear weapon we've got and blow your little piss-ass country right off the face of the earth. You know what he would have said? Bring them on. Because people don't surrender anymore. they got too much, uh, too much pride. That's why we're not going to win. And, and, you know, our Congress doesn't get it. We start wars all over the place. If there was ever something dumb, and I said it at the time, it was going to war in Iraq, and, and, and Afghanistan. That was about the dumbest thing we've ever done, particularly since we'd already learned, we should have learned from the Vietnam War, that we shouldn't start these wars against third world countries. Because everybody's got TV now, and they've got CNN all over the world, and, and, and they know these little countries like uh, the Palestinians and the Iraqis and the Afghans and the Kore- Koreans, they know that if they keep fighting for long enough, that they're on their home turf. they got nowhere to go, so they got to stay there and fight. But our troops are going to want to go home. After about three years, armies get tired of being in the field. That happened in the Civil War. It lasted three years. So did World War I last three years. So did World War II last three years. By then, everybody's sick of it. The flag waving and the bands playing just don't cut it anymore. You know, that works in the first two weeks of the war when the boys march off to war. I'm at Gettysburg. I mean, how many people have seen that? That's an old movie. It, how about Gods and Generals? Boy, you don't like to commit yourselves. <laughs> anyway. Could you, could you say, I, uh, you, uh, you feel that going to a military school as a child was very important to you? Absolutely. Being in the Coast Guard, the I, I was the Coast Guard. Old. So you are not anti-military. No, I was in the military when the Cuban Missile Crisis okay. occurred, and I didn't know about the nuclear weapons at that time. Nobody did. But I wanted to go down and kick Castro's ass. I was uh, on duty. I, I said, let's go. Let's go fight. I was 18. But I don't feel that way now because I learned, learned a lot since then. That was stupid of me. But, 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 but I did learn. But and you thank still, God we didn't attack Cuba. You admire the, uh, the character training that you got from the military. I, I, I love the military. I, I made Gettysburg. I made yeah. Gods and Generals. Okay, I have just a couple of questions because we're coming up on our... Andersonville? One of the most amazing things about Call Me Ted is a book, I've never seen it in anyone else's hands, that you invite people who have been important in your lives, in your life, lives, no wonder I said that. Well, anyway, your many dimensions of your life, you invite them to have um, a passage in the book. And those can be ex-wives. Those I, can be... I got to give the credit to Bill Burke, my co-author. That was his idea. But what? But people. But I went along with it. You know, I, yeah. I had the proof. people who are your critics, people who are saying, right. "Oh, that's not the way." Jerry Levin has a couple of pages. He does. So why did? <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. And then my ex-wife is in there too. She is indeed. <laughs> why did you agree to that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> weak, weak moments. I. I figured I hadn't done that much bad to where the hell tell it all. <laughs> well, I admire your having done that tremendously. I hope it catches on. Um, a few last items, your, your uh, great passage. I've often considered and joked about what I might want written on my tombstone. And I'll read these and I'll just want ask you if there are any new nominations for the epitaph, uh, which will not be used for really decades. Um, anyway, if you have any other epitaph things coming up here and here we have at one point when I felt I couldn't get out of the way of the press the epitaph you had in mind you can't interview me here was a leading candidate (laughs) 
in the middle of my career, I considered, here lies Ted Turner. He never owned a broadcast network. And this is so improbable, it's hard to read it. Uh, these days, I'm leaning toward, I have nothing more to say. <laughs> I came up with those. Uh, the last one, the last one that, needs not to go. To the last that, one doesn't. Well, I have that more to say. That's why I'm writing another book. Yeah. But but but, but, but I did that because it was funny. I was trying to make a, a good joke to, to end it on. It, end, end it with a laugh, particularly after, you know, letting us have it about the nuclear weapons and. Uh, well, and the, there's so many. I just have to say one. Poison gas. Uh, at one point, this is an interesting thing that you had asked your various employees not to use the word foreign or foreigner that you preferred international. Not CNN because there was no foreign. CNN was a global network. Right, right. The and first then one. When Porcel, your, uh, your announcer for the Braves, took this to heart and when a batter had come up to bat and had to step away for a moment, the poor announcer said that the batter had stepped away to remove an international object from his eye. <laughs> Well, he was just picking up on it. It's a good team player there, so I don't know. I think, ladies and gentlemen, that's one of several of many excellent moments in that book where you are. I was coming downstairs and reading lines to my husband. Oh, you have to hear this one. So it is really a fine book, and we can't wait for the next one. Um, in my judgment, one of the things that is greatest about, I'm speaking as a historian now, that you... Um, a great accomplishment is that you have taken what was a very bad split between the cause of environmental preservation and the cause of alleviating poverty and suffering and injustice. You have had those together in your mind. And for much of the environmental movement, that was a problem, that the cause of preserving nature became uh, so big that there really wasn't much room for human justice issues. And you have not had that uh, split. Now, how did, you, how did that reconciliation of those two causes, those two principles, how did that occur? How did you pull those together? Well, when I was going to military prep school, for a while I was a, I rebelled. And I tried to be as bad a student as I possibly could and still not get thrown out. I didn't do anything like stealing or di dishonest or drugs or anything, but I used to be very mischievous. And then one day, and I talk about it in the book, I... Uh, I got a new pair of shoes, and anyway, I, I, I decided that I was, instead of trying to be the most troublesome student in the school, I was going to try and be the best student. And that means best in every way. Best of, and I got the, the medal, the gold medal for uh, the neatest cadet but, but my junior year. And uh, so what I want to see us be is our best in every area. You know, as close to perfection as you can be. Good uh, with other people, good with the environment, good with our friends, good with our neighbors, good with your family. I mean, I've got five children. I, they, they, er, one was born 40 years ago when the population was only 3 billion. I wouldn't have so many if I was doing it again. I wouldn't. But you can't just go out and shoot them, you know. <laughs> We may have to do that before it's over. Um, and that would be a real great tragedy. But that's what they did in Rwanda. The million people that were killed in the genocide was mainly caused by overpopulation and not enough room. People just didn't have enough room. Rwanda is one of the smallest countries in Africa. It is the smallest country, uh, I think. But it's... Uh, one of the most overpopulated. It's very hilly. I've been there. I went and looked at the gorillas, and I, I'm good friends with Paul Kagame, the president of, of Rwanda, who stopped the genocide. And, uh, oh, I mean, he's had some great ideas. I mean, he's being, he gets criticized for uh, pushing democracy pretty hard. But he, he outlawed plastic bags in Rwanda three years ago. Well, completely. Can't sell them. And, uh, and, and, and then that worked so well that he made a law that uh, on the third Saturday of each month, from 8 to 11, the entire country, including him and the cabinet, of his cabinet, go out and pick up trash on the public roads. So Rwanda is as, is clean. You drive around it. It's as clean as Switzerland, which is very rare for an African or Arab country. They're usually 
a lot of trash out the windows, you know. But uh, so anyway, I don't even know what what the point was. Oh, well, but, but do everything right. Right. Try to do everything right. Why not? Try to be as good as you possibly can. Well, you'll get raises that way, you know. I mean, usually. If, 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 if one employee is doing wrong and the other one's doing right, the one doing right will usually get the raise. I mean, your, your life goes better if you're trying to do everything right. Oh, I was going to brag about my, my family a little bit. I have never had any of my children in rehab. I have never had any of my children uh, doing those uh, uh, drug, drug uh, rehabilitation. I mean, that's pretty good. <laughs> Particularly for, you know, a lot of people have a lot of trouble with their kids. <laughs> and I worked real hard, and I wasn't home that much, but I, when I was home, I tried really hard to... Uh, and, and the one cartoon series that I came up with was Captain Planet, you know, which was an eco-hero. And how, how many the younger people would have probably remembered? How, how, many, how many people saw Captain Planet? Okay. Pretty good. How many of you consider yourself planeteers? Oh. <laughs> All right. That's great. That's, that was a significant portion. And there are a lot of older people in the room that wouldn't have been watching the cartoons, so I understand that. Well, we are at the, the time to go. Uh, point, do you, I, young people, you sing, if you, young people, you've received quite a bit of inspiration, have you not? Do you need any more? Do you want to have maybe just a couple of words to the young folks here, and then we'll do our award. Be not the first on which the new is tried, nor yet the last to cast the old aside. Ready. <laughs> if, if, if I would have followed that advice, I wouldn't have done CNN, so it's just a bunch of smoke. <laughs> okay, thank okay. you. Oh, no, 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 stay there. Stay there. Okay, we're going to do this award. Oh. Okay. So, uh, that's what you're here for. Could so. it be cash? <laughs> cash. Um, I'm only kidding. Yeah, I, I thought that might be the case. So, okay, uh, I would like to have the board members, current and past of the Senate of the American West, come down and the staff of the Senate of the American West and form a beautiful arc, a rainbow of board members and staff members back there. Uh, students doing the certificate in Western American studies with the center. Could you be part of that great band? And uh, center faculty, Center of the American West faculty. And oh, and former Stegner Award winners, because we have several, several in the room. So if you would form a lovely band of uh, enthusiasts there. Empire, not evil dreams, but the center of the American West. Good, the good empire here is what you're seeing. So, uh, you can soon. But yes, I do. I do indeed. Okay, uh, I shall now read the the winner of the Stegner Award gets a very handsome thing. Allison Richards, uh, whose husband is here, I think, but she's not here. She does beautiful calligraphy on this, and I shall now read the 2010 Wallace Stegner Award citation. The Stegner Award is given for faithfully and evocatively depicting the spirit of the American West. <clears throat> Despite a little error of birthplace, you remade yourself as a leading Westerner. You have committed your always replenished energy to the most important cause of the 21st century West, the repair and restoration of injured and diminished landscapes and habitats. You have engaged the region and the nation in global matters from our shared responsibility for the planet's atmosphere to a long overdue reckoning with human population growth. In your empathy for human sorrow and your unending efforts to reduce the chance that human beings will suffer the violence of war, you set the model of the West in Wallace Stegner's phrase as the native, excuse, the native home of hope. Wow, thank you very much. <laughs>